What's up, guys? Welcome back to another lesson. Today, we're going to be talking about rotational kinematics and all of its variables, and more importantly, how it relates to linear kinematics and how we can use this almost as a review for linear kinematics. So before we do that, let's look back and see exactly what I'm talking about when I say linear kinematics. In linear kinematics, we dealt with some core variables, and those were x, v, a, and t. This was distance and displacement, this was speed and velocity, this was acceleration, and this was time. So what we're going to do now is this was for an object that was moving from here to there or from here to there, always in a straight line. But now we're going to have an object that's going to be moving kind of like this. It's going to be rotating or spinning, not to be confused with an object in circular motion. This is one object that's spinning about its center of mass. So for example, if I had a disc or a wheel and this was the center of the wheel, there's a particle out here as this wheel spins that travels around in a circle. Those are gonna be the things that we are gonna be identifying because this particle on the disc, it's gonna move a distance, it's gonna move at some speed, I can change that speed, and that will all happen as opposed to time. And so we don't confuse it with linear kinematics, we are gonna give each one of these its own new variable to deal with. But the good news is the concepts of distance and displacement, speed, acceleration, and time, they're not going to change. So it's just going to be about learning the new variables, and that will be fine. Let's start with the first one, which is going to be the rotational kinematics part of distance or displacement. So the first thing we're going to look at is angular displacement. So let's take that same disk again, and here's the center of mass. And out here, there is a particle. Now, as this particle travels around in a circle to say here, it has now covered some theta in degrees. That is the distance that it has traveled when it comes to angular displacement and rotation. Not the arc length out here, but the theta that's in here. And we describe this theta in two different ways. The first way is traditionally the total trip around a circle, so one revolution, is going to be equal to 360 degrees. So from here all the way around is 360 degrees. So that's one way we can describe theta. The other way is in radians, and this is 2 pi for one revolution. And this radian measure is going to be the one that's going to be valuable to us when it comes to angular displacement. So now we can look at the formula, the symbol, and the unit. So the symbol is just in fact that theta. And it has a unit now of radian. Now radian, guys, isn't exactly a unit. It's more of a relationship to 2 pi. But when we work later with velocity and acceleration, we're going to see that we have things in radians per second or radians per second squared. If they ever give you something in revolutions, we'll see later that we are going to have to convert it back into radians. Now, if we're given a linear distance traveled, so that's going to be the actual part out here, we can compare linear displacement to angular displacement. And to do so, there's going to be a format that we're going to follow throughout rotation. And what that format's going to be, it's going to be the linear variable, and that's going to be equal to r, which is how far from the center of rotation that object is, times the angular variable. And like I said, we are going to see this format throughout rotation. So when I want to compare linear displacement to angular displacement, I'm going to list the linear variable for distance, which is just going to be x. Now sometimes this is called s in some textbooks, so either s or x can be used, and that's going to be equal to r times theta. This right here is something that's not on your reference table that you are going to need to memorize, and it's the same format whether we're using velocity or acceleration later on down the line. Linear variable equals r times the angular variable. The next variable that we're going to see is angular velocity. So let's go back to linear once again, because like I said, let's compare everything to linear. For velocity, we had a symbol v, and that was equal to some distance over time. Average v was equal to distance over time, and it had a unit, therefore, of meters per second. Here, we are going to compare the same thing, some distance theta to some time 
with now a new unit of radian per second, but we just need a symbol here for angular velocity. That symbol is omega, w. And just like we had v bar, delta v, v initial, v final, etc., now in angular we are going to look at different types of omegas. We can have an average omega. We can have a change in omega. We can have an omega initial, omega final, etc. And we're going to be able to use all of these formulas anytime we see something for angular speed. And the linear relationship, like we just said, is the linear variable v is equal to r times the angular variable. Okay, so that's the same as saying x equals r theta. I just want to keep repeating that because that's something that we have to memorize. Now, there's one thing to note, and that's with this right here, the unit. Sometimes, actually more times than I'd like, we will see a number written in revolutions per minute. So, for example, 40 revs per minute equals initial omega. Unfortunately, guys, we cannot use revolutions per minute. We must do a unit conversion and get it to radians per second. I'm going to walk through that example right now. So just like any other unit conversion, we write down our given, 40 revs per minute. We are going to multiply by some ratio. We're going to write what we want to get rid of on the bottom and what we want on the top. Then what we have to do is write the ratio of this. So one revolution is equal to 2 pi. What that does is get rid of revolutions and just live radians per minute. But we can't have radians per minute either. We have to get rid of that minute. So once again, we'll unit convert. We'll write minutes on the top, seconds on the bottom. One minute is 60 seconds. That will now cancel out minutes and leave what we need, radians per second. So essentially, the omega naught that we'd use is 40 times 2 pi divided by 60. That will give us radians per second. And we have to do this every single time we see revolutions per minute. It gets a little bit annoying, but these are the units that we are going to have to use when we start putting them into other formulas. One of the more difficult parts of linear kinematics was velocity graphs. So I want to look at angular velocity graphs and an example that I've seen on the AP Classroom. And I want to work through it and show you exactly how you would solve it. And also some things that you need to look out for. Okay, so in this example, a point on a disc rotates around the center of the disc with an initial angular velocity of 3 radians per second clockwise. It then accelerates to a speed of 7 radians per second counterclockwise in 2 seconds. Which graph best shows the relationship between omega and t? Pause the video, pick which one you'd want, and explain to yourself why you chose that answer. I think there's a pretty obvious one here. This b, that needs to go away. Because we know we have some sort of initial speed of 3 radians per second. So this has an initial speed of 0, so I'm going to get rid of this graph. Now we're left with a situation where does this object slow down, its speed decrease, or did it increase? Well, it went from 3 to 7, so now A is going to be out as well. So we have some sort of initial speed and we get faster. Okay, but now there's a hidden thing here that we have to recall some old information, and that's right here and right here. We remember from torque that clockwise is a negative direction. So essentially, when I say 3 radians per second clockwise, I'm essentially saying negative 3 radians per second. That is omega initial. So that's why we are going to start here and we are going to end up here, and why this one right here is not correct. Because in regular linear kinematics, we say that positive and negative velocity is just minus or plus. Here we denote positive and negative with clockwise and counterclockwise. So this is a positive initial speed, where we had a negative initial speed, which makes this answer choice D. Let's look at another example. Okay, so right here it says M applies a torque to a pulley causing it to rotate from rest. The mass hits the floor at T equals one second. Graph the angular speed of the pulley and the vertical linear speed of M until T2. 
So you can pause the video, try and think about how you'd sketch these two graphs, the angular speed of the pulley rotating, and then the vertical speed of M. And this would just be a sketch. We know that the pulley starts from rest, and this is gonna apply a net torque on that object. And that net torque is gonna be constant. So the acceleration of this object, this pulley, is going to be constant as well, and its speed is gonna increase. So I'm just gonna draw a point up here. I'm gonna say, if I wanna go from zero to here, at a constant acceleration, the slope of a speed versus time graph is acceleration. The same is gonna be held true here. The slope of a W versus T graph is gonna tell me the acceleration of that object, so it is gonna be a nice straight line. But then at T1, this hits the floor, so there's no more torque that's gonna be applied. And if this is a frictionless pulley, it's gonna look like this. The speed will not change because of Newton's law, an object in motion will remain in motion until stopped by an outside force. There's no outside force to speed this up or slow it down. It will remain at the same speed. The same can be true for the block. It starts here at rest, and it is gonna speed up due to gravity, which is constant, and it's gonna speed up until T1. But then at T1, it hits the ground, its speed stops, and there is no more vertical motion. So that'd be the difference between the angular speed of the pulley and the vertical speed of this object. Now just like linear velocity has a direction and is a vector, so does angular velocity. And to find the direction of the angular velocity, we're gonna use something called the right hand rule. So let's take for example, two centers of mass, one here and one here. And now here there is a particle that is gonna be rotating around the center of mass this way. And we'll do the opposite over here. There's a mass out here, R from the center of mass, and it rotates around the center of mass this way. To find the direction of the angular velocity, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our right hand and we are gonna wrap our fingers around the direction of motion. So your palm is gonna be facing this way with your right hand. As you wrap your fingers around, you are going to stick your thumb out and the direction of your thumb is the direction of the angular velocity. So if you were to do this right now, you would see that your thumb is pointing straight out of the screen. And to draw towards you or out of the page, we draw a dot with a circle around it. Kind of like if you saw an arrowhead coming directly at you, you would see the tip of that arrow. Now the same thing here, now remember, we don't switch to our left hand, we stay with the right hand. If you were to put your right hand so the palm is now facing this way, and we wrap our fingers around, now your thumb is gonna point into the screen, okay, or into the page. So in this case, we would draw into the page of the direction of angular velocity by drawing an X with a little circle around it. Just like an arrow, once again, if an arrow is traveling away from you, you would see the fins in the arrow. That's how we're gonna find the direction of the angular velocity of an object that's rotating around its center of mass. So the last variable we have is angular acceleration, okay? And we'll just jump right into it. The symbol is going to be alpha. And then the good news is it's the same letter to start with, alpha and acceleration. And it's gonna have a unit now of radians per second squared. Just like in linear acceleration, we had meters per second squared. Here we are going to have radians per second squared. So let's look at some quick relationships like we've been doing. We had x equals r theta. We had v equals r times omega. Now we'll have linear acceleration is equal to r times alpha. These three right here, guys, you have to remember. And to be honest, the way I used to do it as a student is I thought that angular and rotation was a little more complicated. So it had two things on the right side of the equal sign where linear was always a little bit easier. So it was just always by itself. That's how I remembered as a student. But you are going to have to compare linear with uh, rotation and angular. So you have to memorize these. And I'll give you an example of that in just one second. And as far as how to solve for angular acceleration, well, let's look back to linear. A equals delta V over T. And it also we say V final minus V initial over T. So using what we've seen so far, pause the video for a second and draw what you think the formula for the angular acceleration is going to be. It's simply going to be alpha equals a change in omega over t, where omega can also be expressed as omega final minus omega naught over t. This is how we solve for the angular acceleration. Let's take a look at an example of that. Okay, so Avery's on a carousel at rest. She is located three meters from the center of rotation of that carousel. 
when it begins to accelerate to 0.4 radians per second in 10 seconds. What is Avery's angular acceleration and her linear acceleration as well? Just like we've always done, guys, let's give some givens. Her initial angular speed is zero radians per second. Her final angular speed is 0.4 rads per second. And her T is going to be 10 seconds. And she is listed at R3 meters from the axis of rotation. So I'm going to solve for the first part now. And I'm going to say that alpha is equal to a change in omega over T. So that is 0.4 rad per second divided by 10 seconds, which means that her angular acceleration was 0.04 rad per second squared. If I then want to compare her linear acceleration to her angular acceleration, I do A equals R theta, 3 meters times 0.04 rad per second squared, and I get a linear acceleration of 0 0.2, 0 0.12 meters Per second squared. So let's sum all of this up in just one page. First, the things that you need to memorize. You need to memorize the linear to angular relationships. X equals R theta, V equals R omega, and A equals R alpha. Those need to be memorized. You need to know those. Then we have our basic relationships of delta V equals x over t that now becomes average omega equals theta over t. We have acceleration is equal to delta v over t, which now becomes alpha equals a change in omega over t. But guys, this can be used also in our very other basic kinematics formulas that we used early in the year. Do you guys remember this? x equals x naught plus v naught t plus one half a t squared v final squared equals v initial squared plus two a x and v final equals v initial plus a t pause the video right now and make these all into rotational kinematics formulas theta equals theta naught plus omega naught t plus one half alpha t squared. Omega final squared equals omega initial squared plus two alpha theta. And omega final equals omega initial plus alpha t. If you can use all these formulas, guys, you are going to be great. I'm going to give you a bunch of practice. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments below or shoot me an email. I'll be happy to help you out. If this video did help you. Give it a thumbs up. Share it with a friend taking physics, and I'll catch you on the next one.